welcome to the Find the Way podcast. In this show, we will try to explore what is happening in emerging markets and how entrepreneurs, investors, and communities are simply finding the way to make phenomenal things happen, regardless how volatile the environment may sometimes seem. Um, you're currently managing um, both Overboost and Kamai still. Like, well, what is exactly the, 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 the difference between the two? Sure. Overboost is the, um, the sort of management company f- from where or we, we manage the different vehicles we have, which is Kamai. And we still manage or I still manage uh, Seagrass Capital too as a vehicle today. And for Kamai, how, how big is the fund? Uh, the fund is a relatively small fund in terms of uh, international terms. It's, it's a uh, $25 million fund. Um, so we invest in seed stage and, and sort of pre-series A. Uh, we believe that there is where uh, also corporates can add a lot of help in, in sort of validation processes and the ability to do proofs of concept and different other things to validate and help the entrepreneurs develop their businesses. Okay. Yeah. And then if we now jump into a little bit of the history of, of corporate venture capital, CVC in, in Latin America, Vanessa, you've been working with, you worked for a couple of years with Vaira, the allegedly the first CVC in Latin America um, that was founded in 2011. What has happened in a way in now in, in, in the very nascent history of CVC of, of, um, in LATAM? Why was it only 2011? that the first corporate venture fund was was initiated. Either one of you can, can respond to this, but is this really the case that 2011 was the first CBC that came out into existence in LATAM? Yeah, I think like maybe at the moment, I don't know, what do you think, Gabi? Um, yes, um, corporates in, in Latin America until then had been primarily doing acquisitions and they didn't really know how to work with venture. Um, the first initiatives and, and, and my sort of learning cur- came through Europe, through the UK, actually, where you had uh, both from sort of the impact side to the corporate uh, investment side examples like um, 3M or, or um, uh, Bridges Ventures, which was sort of the first investment uh, impact investment fund out of the UK and, and sort of in the world. And um, so Latin America had uh, very little experience on that. And coming with that experience from Europe, I think that uh, although we were acting in Latin America more or less at the same time where it was created and, and um, I participate of of several of the discussions. Uh, Gonzalo Martin Villa, which was the uh, creator wide at, at Telefonica, um, uh, ma- it made sense because they started out of Spain and, and there wasn't very much entrepreneurial activity in Spain at the time. So they came and, and looked at Latin America. And, and the original intent is he said, uh, I want to I want to shake things up. I want to, you know, move the ecosystem and see what comes out of this. I don't know if we're going to be successful. I don't know how to do it, but we'll start shaking things up and see what happens. And, and, and who was this person who had this thought, this, this is like, say, rebellious thought in, in, in mind? Who was this person again? Gonzalo Martin Villa. Mm-hmm. He's still director of innovation uh, at uh, Telefonica today. It was an initiative of... Uh, um, of, of Alvarez Pagete, which is the CEO of Telefonica today, before he was CEO, actually. Okay. From the inside, do you think this mindset is still existing today? Ten, ten, after 10 years? I've, I believe that they've learned a great deal um, and they made a lot of mistakes along the way, as, as you should. Um, but they've learned sort of of the different stages on where they could add the most value. They tried it all. They tried it from the crowd working spaces to wider the accelerator to the Amerigo funds to the Telefonica Ventures alternative. And, and they've tried all the stages and they realized that there are certain stages where them as a company and culturally they could add more value. And, and, um, um, and I've seen a lot of people criticize that, but I, what I always say and having watched the sort of the journey is, uh, there was a, 
there was a big learning curve and 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 they got a a lot of the lessons for the rest of the community uh you know that come from them but they were actually doing it so um and and I'm a believer of and of, of doing you know do then speak you know I mean walk the talk actually uh get your hands dirty and and make it happen so I think what they did was that and and they learned that um, they had to flexibilize terms. I, I've had several discussions with them with their original term sheets and things, but they accepted feedback and they they have that adapted and they evolved and and uh, and I think today CVC is an option and an alternative in in Latin America because those guys also started you know putting things in motion. Um, and and how long did it take for other CVCs to come in to play? Um, after Vida was, I would say then um, Meli actually started, and we were working together with Marcos Galperin, and and he was doing some individual investments as a successful entrepreneur. Um, and then he decided it ma- it made sense to do it from Meli, uh, and uh, Meli started probably doing the first investments around 2013-14. Um, we're actually discussing this yesterday. We had a, a CVC meetup in, in Sunchales with San Seguros Ventures, which they, 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 they really spoiled us with a trip to Sunchales and seeing the, the first things that were done there. And, uh, uh it was, uh, quite nice. And, um, and, and, and Marco Raizani and, and, uh, Jose Majorens from, from, from Melly were remembering when when it started and it was 2013 and it took them a you know a year and a half to start doing the first investments and now they've deployed teams in different geographies and they're actively doing um uh corporate venturing from an internal perspective uh coming from sort of a a, a technology first company because they were already a, a, a tech company to start with um then we start probably then as of uh, 2015, 16, you start seeing the first initiatives uh, of open innovation from different companies trying things out. Uh, like Disney did certain things, the innovation labs inside and, and, and tried. To, and then even Coca Cola started doing some things in Mexico and, and Israel and a couple of other geographies. Uh, but I think the initiative varies a lot according to the size of the company and the culture of the company and, and, and how flexible that can be. Um, and, and, and so you see some initiatives prosper, uh, more than others based on and, 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 and relative to that. Um, I always like to say that and, and that any sort of corporate innovation or, or CVC program starts uh, with one to three years of learning and, and, and the program is quite unstable. Um, and it's sort of a top-down approach in, in what they want to do. And it's where most of the mistakes are made because if you ask the companies why they want to do this, the answer is they don't know. Um, and um, and after two or three years, they start seeing, and if they have some quick wins, then it happens. And then they really structure it from there on to from year three, four to year seven. And if you go after, if if it sort of stays in place for more than seven years, they crack the way of doing it. And, and it tends to be something more permanent. For, from there, Vanessa, did Vida crack what they were doing? You, you joined year eight or year nine. To the, to the, to the journey of Vida, um, had they cracked that down already or were they still clueless what they were well, doing? I, I think they did. I mean, like, as Gabby said before, like, they had like a very, like, the way they started, like, it was like through as- acceleration or incubation processes. And in 2018, they turned to be just the CBC strategy, investing directly in companies, exiting into the ones that were not really the ones that were going to give the, even like financial returns because the perspective was changed completely into a more strategic way of, of adding value to the portfolio companies. And as well, Waira like created 
some other programs uh, for corporate innovation so that they could help other corporates to start like opening their their open innovation initiatives so yeah like i could say like from from when i met waira when i was in 2015 and comparing it to the to when i started working there the thesis was completely changed uh, as well as like the portfolio companies and 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 the programs that they were running at the moment so i mean it took at least 8 years for them to, to to understand also because i mean i i could say this but in 2015 or 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 12 when they when they started there were not actually like this ecosystem and and founders they didn't know like the like specific rules about how to start uh, building their startups right so i think wida was a very good partner at that moment for for creating that ecosystem of first second third generation of startups founders that who already have like that mindset about how to building a startup and making it successful over the time so yeah i think like th that's in context and and, and currently the focus of, of Lyra is so the if it has changed along the way, the mistakes were done in the first years, and they kind of like paved the way for 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 and set the standards for others to to follow suit in when it comes to corporate venturing in, in Latin America. And and now the focus is exactly what they invest like in early stage. Um, they are usually follower investors, and yeah, man, they're, they're pretty focused like on investing in a very like specific thesis, which is like the B two B. And sometimes they divide the, th the thesis in like three parts. So when one is like big bets, the other one it's internal fit, and the other one could be external fit, which is how really Telefonica as a data company or telco company could add value to that startup. Yeah, yeah, that that's that what I could say on my end. And and, and Gabby, from from let's say you mentioned that Coca Cola is is one of your. It's the main financier of, of the project. Yes, the Arcor Group and Coca-Cola, one of our uh, uh, our two sort of anchor uh, LPs or founding partners of Kamai Ventures. And why? Why now? Why 2019? Why? Why did they 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 start getting the wheels moving, actually getting the hands dirty, and and doing something more than talking? Um, why? Because they needed to digitalize both their supply chain and their uh, traditional channel. Uh, it, 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 they're both segments that um, have to do with the ecosystem surrounding CPGs more than uh, the core of the CPG business. And uh, they found that was an issue that affected not only them, but also other other corporates in the same space. And Latin America couldn't help their, there was no way that the traditional channel were, was going to digitize it, uh, itself uh, by itself because, you know, your small sort of uh, stores and uh, mom and pop shops will not adopt technology if, if it's not helped by somebody else. Um, and when in Latin America, you look at the ecosystem in general, that happens both more on the supply side, even in, in, in from the ag tech side and, the, and, and, and where, um, things are produced. Um, all of that sort of value chain is, uh, and the infrastructure around it in Latin America was, was lagging. And so it needed, um, uh, a jump start, um, and I think they saw, and we all saw that that was uh, that there was a, a lot of of common links among different CPGs and made, making something that was cross uh, around uh, across the industry made sense, um, and also um, we believe strongly that involving corporates in the Latin American um, ecosystem was. Key, uh, because uh, Latin America doesn't have the depth of financial markets, for example, the U.S. has. Um, so, uh, in order to bring that um, change and that uh, sort of uh, digitalization and inclusion uh, in the region, you needed to have the corporates be part of the play. Um, so that's how it came about. 
What kind of collaboration do you have now between the startups and Kamai? Is there any collaboration whatsoever? Uh, yes, we have between you, I mean, our portfolio companies and the corporates through Kamai. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, we do. Um, we work together uh, very much. We establish a, a sort of working plan with each one of the corporates to see where the fit is. And we work in developing from uh, different proofs of concept to licensing agreements to um, simple sort of uh, um, business development and, and working as providers of the corporates, um, opening doors, um, working in their branding, working in their communication, working on their um, um, sort of, uh, you know, ability to or negotiating agreements with them. Uh, we have companies like uh, Kilimo in our portfolio where today they're developing uh, producers uh, in terms of water savings in a methodology that Kilimo does that is sort of the one and recognized methodology in, in the world. Um, and uh, we got them into working with Coca-Cola in different areas and producers they 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 work with or they buy from actually. Um, so you give that benefit to them. You give them the tool you measure throughout three years, the water savings. Last year only, for example, they saved over 50 billion liters of water um, in in Mexico and Peru and in Chile and different areas and parts of Argentina. Um, they're also working with, uh, we have our event working with our, the Arco Group in terms of an ag tech platform and optimizing their productivity over 15% on those areas. That gives them great, you know, business cases for the startups to present to other potential customers in the market. Um, so yes, we work a lot. Uh, we have, we built also a board of bottlers with all the bottlers that operate, uh, uh, all the Coca-Cola bottlers that work in, in the region in order to present the solutions to them on a regular basis and develop businesses. Uh, we have actually more cases of strategic alliances developed with the corporates, the companies that we have in our portfolio. And it was the same with with uh, Vanessa, with Vaira, when you were there? We usually had to have like this business development area where we connected like all the startup with the, with the businesses. And yeah, I mean, like right now at the moment here at Leap, also we have like this interaction with Bank of America, which we is one of our LPs. We usually like invest hardly in, in fintechs and in payment infrastructure. So we usually connect those companies with the like with the chief of innovation from Bank of America, as well for those uh, companies that we have invested in the SaaS or e-commerce, we connect them with Grupo Coppel, which is their biggest retailer. Uh, and and on a, they also have like their their bank branch. So we also connect them with them. Uh, and yes, I think like for corp- like when you're managing like a corporate innovation strategy all along with the CBC, uh, financial returns. You, what you're trying to do, it's also trying to connect with new oppor- business opportunities between the corporate or the parent company and you as a fund because you want your financial returns, right? So, I think that's a very good way into creating like this value add platform uh, and connecting those business development uh, areas and strategic. Uh, yeah, strategic alliances between your portfolio companies and and, and the corporates. And but then, for, if we look at from the startup side, how how is the perception from the startups towards CVCs? That just to give a little little, little background story on, on on the matter is that um, also from personal experience, when 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 corporates are you know looking into and 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 raising an interest of investing directly at the startup uh, that they're collaborating with uh, in a supplier partner relationship, whatnot. Um, or if there's a CVC arm, it's an indirect ownership. Um, there are certain cases in Europe or the U S so to speak, the Western world uh, where startups are not that keen to, to, to put their, put their eggs into that basket where corporate has a larger say. Uh, um, so how, how are the startups receiving this game? In, in Latin America? I think that um, 
I mean, the, what you're proposing was certainly true about um, seven to 10 years ago uh, or around that time. Uh, that I think that perception has changed globally because uh, corporates have understood that they need to play by market terms. So term sheets have changed a lot. Um, uh, ROFO clauses, other type things have disappeared from term sheets and, and they're not market conditions. One of the things that we tell our corporates all the time is uh, what they cannot do um, or, or what's not fair play for the startups. We cannot limit uh, the exit for, for startups or the alternatives for startups or reduce their flexibility in any way, shape or form. Um, and that is something that has evolved quite a bit, not only in, in Latin America, but in the world in general. Now you have a lot of, of VC firms, of uh, uh, pure financial VC plays that are, um, investing alongside corporates and you have corporates investing in VC funds too. So, uh, plays are far more flexible. Um, in that sense, I think startups now see in Latin America that there is a true way to work with corporates in a way that they can develop business and they can, they can help them develop business. And um, particularly after last year, I think that uh, a lot more companies, after 2021, a lot more companies appreciate developing business aside from getting capital as, as a key uh, strategic value from any investor, not just corporates. And corporates are able to do that far more. Um, when an, Another interesting aspect that you see is that in the downturn where financial players uh, tend to hold back their capital because of sort of global market conditions, um, CVCs have only restricted their investments. Uh, in, for example, last year, CVC investment only went down 2% when uh, financial VC investment went down almost 50%, uh, which is, is very, it's very interesting. And it shows you sort of the stability of, over time that uh, corporates can provide. In that sense, again, uh, what I see is startups are now, in, for some of our cases, there are, which I think is the best recommendation ever, one entrepreneur is recommending us to another entrepreneur saying, you know, they're a good investor. They truly deliver. They're actually doing, you know, you get to do business and you get to grow your business. Um, we work a lot in, in trying to bring down those walls of perceptions of the past or some corporates, which are might be left out there that have not sort of yet uh, or they're starting and they, they're thinking in a more rigid way or they came from their M&A times uh, or M&A activity. And we try to make very clear what's M&A and what's um, venture building and why do you do corporate venturing, uh, which might be um, venture clienting, which might be open innovation, which might be CVC investments. Um, and, and those are different forms and those things are shaping up to mean different things. Um, and I, I believe that value is, is coming across pretty clearly for the ecosystem. Um, and another piece of data, because I saw it yesterday, is one third of global investments right now come from CVCs onto the venture uh, world. And do you know the portion of that in, in Latin America? Is it the same ratio or... It it's, it, it's about the same ratio, but if you take the last sort of three, four years, it has grown at a much faster pace than the sort of VC did. Um, although VC grew a lot because you, you, the capital flowing into Latin America has been doubling year on year, and, and, and in 2020 and 2021, it more than tripled. So, uh, and, and when things sort of uh, got drier uh, last year, uh, it didn't ask much in Latin America as in other regions uh, because I think it was underinvested before. Uh, so yeah, and and, and 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 just a question over there. You mentioned earlier in, in your intro that you made thirty five investments, seven exits. Have any of those exits been into your main LPs, so the main corporates? Actually, no, none. And Vanessa, in in your case with Vira and your experience, do you know? the situation with Vida? I mean, we, 
at that moment, we didn't make any any mergers or acquisitions. I mean, there has been a couple of them in history, but they're more in Europe, not in Latin America. In Latin America. Mm -hmm. if, if you see another statistic on that is as CVC has been evolving on less than 5% of the investments done through CVCs have ended up in an, in a corporate acquisition. Uh, the rest have been incorporating, you know, uh, methodologies of work, uh, making a licensing agreement, um, knowing what's coming, uh, understanding the market, access to knowledge. Um, it's been a lot more around that. Um, and also you start seeing some CVC units, and this was mentioned by the people from WIRA yesterday, um, that they already are through their exits, they're funding their own CVC strategy today. So it's yeah. sort of gone full circle. And, and, and there you mentioned now licensing agreements. And I think that this is a, this is also a tricky one from a perspective is that, okay, if you're sitting in, in the middle, pretty much, you know, trying to support as much as you can, your portfolio companies. And then at the same time, you know, the license, the, the other side of the, 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 the agreement is one of your corporates. How do you, how do you coach guide, the parties to come into a fair agreement because to be frank, corporates can be big time bullies when it comes to licensing agreements and it can be a pretty crap to work with them on, on larger deals. And as a young startup, number one, you don't have the resources to, to match the legal team of the other side. And number two, you're just, you know, following the Benjamins, the dollars so quickly that you don't might not even care. And then you sign a deal that can be catastrophic for your potential exit situation. How 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 are those playing out? Because the reality is that those are tough tough contracts to be made. Absolutely, um, a good portion of our sort of counseling to startups and the fact that we are a separate team and an independent team is what we do. Um, we were discussing not so long ago the Kilimo case, and part of of the agreement we did was. And, and how we work was making sure the entrepreneur didn't sign anything damaging and pushing the corporation against any kinds of, of exclusivities or any of those funny things that, and, and the funny portion of that is today, a lot of those things are built into the structure of processes of the corporations and the heads deciding this thing, they don't even want that anymore. But it's built into sort of the, the, uh, the sort of the body of complexities and processes and procedures you have in a corporation, which I guess they need to exist in order to manage the size of things they have. But um, um, you need to know how to crack them. And the ability of the C sort of CVC unit or fund acting and 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 having the dialogue at, at sort of the top of the food chain in the corporation and being more independent uh, allows you to cut through those sort of red tapes and and, and disentangle sort of the the webs there, um, and, and and that's what we primarily try to do, uh, and and we call it you know doing business with corporations and not dying in the process. But um, uh, we 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 had a. a uh, in, in one of our events uh, early in March, we had a session and a workshop, which was about that, about this, about doing business with corporations or things you should take into account and what things you shouldn't. So. Yeah. And, and on, on that sense, like, let's say Vanessa and Gabby, have you, how have you seen now that has the reality of conducting business uh, with the corporates, has it gotten easier? Now in the let's say past three to five years, meaning that uh, you know, like startups are getting excited when they they get their let's say letter of intent, memorandum of understanding for a big multi-million dollar deal with corporate, but the, the complexity and the reality of actually getting married with some of these um, bigger players can destroy your whole company from just a per uh, perspective of you you customize your products and, and processes to tailor the needs of that client and the other, you cannot serve other clients. You're going to be completely dependent on that if you're 80 
to 90% of your revenue comes from, from that account. Um, those are huge red, red signals for, for new, new money coming into your organization, potential exit. Uh, and there will always be things that go south. Um, and then if you're too dependent on these corporates that you mentioned with Kidimo, that, you know, being able to save tremendous amount of, of water, um, how do you how do you work with the startups that uh, or do you coach them not mm-hmm. to be too reliant on on these bigger accounts because it seems great it seems so tempting to go after these larger accounts and let's say with coca cola who, who who doesn't want to work with coca cola you know i think it's not for everyone well i mean we have this term that maybe some Venture capital firms, they see unicorns, but maybe for corporate venture capital firms, it's something called like, like dragons. So not all businesses are working with corporates. I mean, they cannot scale with, with, with a traditional corporate model, but some of them they can and they come, they become like very stable companies and they have like very stable revenues over the time and they can start scaling also like with the, the same corporate, uh, business areas but i think it's not for all uh, that's my perspective and that's how i have been seeing it and because i mean at what i and even here at leap we have some companies that they have been scaling up really really fast uh, working along with coppel or with bank of america or with uh, cafeño but we have some others that that they haven't i mean and it's not because there is no willingness from any of each parts, but it's because maybe the, the model it's not scaling the way it should by a B2B strategy strategy. So yeah, maybe maybe that's something I could say on my end. Mm-hmm. I mean, to your point, yes, it, the it it is very tempting and you see startups, you know, getting tempted and, and making their business dependent. We try to, you know shy them away from that and, 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 and try to, uh, have them diversify as much as possible. Um, I would say the challenge today is with the corporates we work, we pretty much have them coached and, and, and we manage what we're doing. Um, but sometimes it, uh, which I think in a way it's helpful too. Sometimes we end up having to, uh, negotiate or stand uh, in front of other co-investors because we co-invest with other corporates too and, and sort of standard VCs too. And sometimes we have to put a break into a VC firm that some, that might want to scale too fast and spend too much money scaling and not thinking too much about runways. That has been changing, but at a point in time that was the case and throwing too much money out of there and not caring about unit economics I think it was always a mistake, and I always thought it was a mistake. Um, it's nail it, then scale it. That's my motto, but uh, you, you saw a lot of other things. And then with some other corporates, sometimes they want to put their foot down, and, and you know there is some sort of bad habits out there. But for startups, the fact that they could have more than one player um, in their cap table that does this and understand them, um, we um, and I've done it, you know, Okay, don't worry. I'll talk to them, and I stand with Arcor and Coca Cola, uh, um, you know, behind me and and others. Uh, so you, corporate X, want to do this? Listen, we don't play like that, and we can find others to play like this. So you know, you you have the ability to do that kind of thing. So I think that the broader you open that, um, it is a process. Um, I have to say that not everything is is it's uh also so so rose and pinky and and nice on the VC side sometimes as we know. If we if we, if we look from let's say the corporate side um we covered a little bit of that at the beginning but um what are they really looking for at this time um why do they keep putting money in 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 to open up their venture venture arms. I believe what they're looking for uh, at the business unit level is uh, growing their businesses and uh, having doing business in an easier way, um, and finding adjacent sort of um, 
business lines or strategies or things that they can do, uh, alternative distribution channels, um, and staying relevant, staying, being, you know, I, I, a lot of, of the companies, if you look at the shift on the sort of Fortune 500 companies in the world, um, uh, yesterday also we're discussing that um, 40% of the companies that left the list um, were corporates that had never done any any corporate venturing whatsoever. And 100% of the companies that made the list had all corporate venturing initiatives. They needed to stay relevant to uh, to remain uh, uh, significant and to have their and to keep their business edge. Uh, as 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 uh, as a famous speaker says, um, it's an infinite game. So if you want to stay in it, you need to adapt and change and stay. Yeah, I could just add that maybe on the U.S. perspective, it's also like this opportunity. I mean, some of these corporates are also constituting their opportunity funds because they want to address and get into new markets such as, yeah, the, the minority groups like Latinx and Black communities. So I think it's also an alternative for, for corporates to start jumping in into diversity and investing in new alternative markets. But yeah, they have to maintain, like as Gabby said, they they had to maintain relevant and can access to new technologies that maybe, of course, they can, their internal teams can, of course, develop it, but they won't do it. So through these open innovation strategies, they can give access to new founders and, and, and people like external people to start developing new business opportunities that maybe the corporate won't have time or won't be interested to do it in, at that moment. At the pace innovation has, you may not, you cannot stay relevant trying to keep the state of the art of an industry or, or an activity from within. The, the, the sort of uh, development sort of units or, or the, the, the investigation units internal of, uh, that were internal to the companies are sort of a thing of the past. They can, They cannot keep up with the state of the art uh, of, of things. I mean, what we're seeing today with generative AI only and the force that might have to change a lot of activities, they don't even know what's coming. And, and um, as, as when internet did, um, I think this is as big as a revolution or maybe uh, more and, and, And corporates have realized, and particularly post-pandemic, um, that they needed, that what they thought was a nice to have was a must have, and that they needed to catch up and they needed to stay, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, adjourn with the, with the reality of, of how things change. Um, so I, I think they became a lot more conscious. If you think the amount of CBC units that were established from the pandemic to today, it more than doubled the amount that you had pre-pandemic. Yeah, so CBC, you mentioned a couple of times how it has changed over the five, 10 year span. Have you seen this, any type of changes from the other side? So from the startups, the founders, or is it just that we have more money now to spend on the ecosystem? Yes, you have more money in the ecosystem. You have more projects before, um, VC was sort of tech based only. Um, and now, uh, you have far more industries that are susceptible to VC funding. Uh, that before, um, you know, I don't think that 10 years ago we thought that you could invest in biotech with, with VC funding or VC type money. Um, so I think the asset class is growing, uh, And, um, and, and I think that's a very good thing in terms of the pace of development. Um, and I think that also the market is maturing in having different kinds of investors, uh, that are good for different things at different stages. So, uh, you have certain opportunity or very specific funds that are very good, um, 
and 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 they can provide the knowledge and and I think the asset class has adapted to that and not just making venture capital an option for consumer tech companies, which was sort of the beginning of it all. Um, so I think that's a positive thing. Yeah. So you mentioned that there's more diversity, but you probably both want to say, oh, you see a lot of deals happening, a lot of deals, deal flow as well. How about the quality of the startups? How about the quality of the founders, uh, their processes, their mental uh, shift, their, their processes, everything just how has that changed in the last 10 years for, let's say? Yeah, I mean, like, I could say that it's a drastic change. I, I can compare, like, ten, like eight or 10 years ago, like, the founder mindset was very different compared to the, the one that we're facing right now. I was, like, two two weeks ago, I was in a panel with two two very big founders that they, they had an exit into public markets. And something that they were also talking about is that also what, what's happening right now because of having so much uh, cash on table, like right now, this new generation of founders, maybe I could say like the ones that, that came into the after COVID era, are so focused on devaluation and like bringing it up that they they started like, I don't know, like losing the, the, the sight of how it's more important to maintain a good product and scaling that product. So maybe it's like, like generational founders have been changing their mindset. I could say right now could be a little bit more uh, mature, but at some times, some of them, they're, they're just like focusing on valuations and not on the, on, on the companies and the products. So maybe we're facing like this new frustration era, but I think like even at this type of crisis moments, uh, very good founders come, came, are going to come out. I don't think there's such like a a, a, a concept of a founder and how how he has to be or she has to be. But I think that after COVID, that happened to many of of, of the founders. Like they're so stressed out because of the pressure that they're having from from busy funds. No, I mean I I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I would only add that. When I started in 1997, we didn't even call it venture capital. Um, and what you see today, and and there's, I think there's a bit on the founder side. Uh, you have extremely good founders and very talented people and very resilient people, which you need to be in order to be an entrepreneur. But we have also gone through a phase of sort of being an entrepreneur is fashionable, is trendy, and everybody that does something on their own ends up being an entrepreneur. And building something at scale that has impact in the world is extremely difficult and it remains so. And so I believe that there's there's more opportunity for those people to get uh, sort of the best uh help and access to the kind of capital and support they need because there's more diversity, but there's also a lot more noise of a lot of other people that might be sort of, I don't know, um, holiday entrepreneurs. And after, you know, touring the world a couple of years, they, they go back and they find a job because they need to settle down and have a family, uh, different to the person that risks a lot. And, uh, it has their family and it has their life committed to this. Um, and we can discuss the, the work-life balance in another talk, but yeah, I think there's, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's been a shift in, in all of that. And, I, and just quickly, I, I would love to go back on, on what we just talked just a, a, a minute ago. Um, ha have any of the founders from either one of you, when you've been working, let's say Vanessa with Vaira and Gabby now with your new um, new projects that, that you're working on, is that have the founders ever, let's say, questioned the corporates that that are giving you a mandate to utilize their cash? Um, 
to keep their eyes open in the market. You mentioned there, Gabby, is that they have to to keep up with the new tech, the corporates, they need to be able to rejuvenate, they need to be able to, to innovate, to keep moving forward. Um, and a great way to do that is to, to keep your eyes open on, on the new technologies, what's, what's out there. So have the founders ever ask in a way that, hey, isn't this a great way for, for the corporates to, to source deals, keep an eye on the things that they really don't want to build because nobody wants to build the, you know, the first steps. It's, it's, it sucks. It's horrible. Nobody wants to do that, especially corporates. They want to build things at scale, as you mentioned. Um, so it, it, in a way, this could be seen as, as, as a number one, a great marketing gig for Coca Cola, for instance, to, you know, hey, Coca Cola is doing great. They're investing in startups, but these are so peanuts. It's like the same thing that for me, I'm about to go and buying a lollipop from, from a kiosk, uh, in, in a way. And, and, and then basically, but if they see something coming out of your portfolio that is going to be really changing the status quo and it can really make them increase their productivity, efficiency. There could be two alternatives. Number one, to buy, or number two, to build it on their own. Because if it's important enough, they would build it on their own. Have Are the founders in Latin America questioning this and the role of the corporates in this way? I think some are, yes. Um, and it's always good to do so. I think it's always good to question. Um, in reality, as they know... The corporates more and more, they realize that it's very difficult for them to do that. Um, it's very, um, it's very difficult or the concept of stealing somebody's idea. It's, it's so past tense and it's, it's so, you know, past century, um, you know, execution is, is what's means everything. I mean, I, uh, executions is where things happen uh, and, and where you make the difference. So um, we sometimes do coach entrepreneurs in understanding that, you know, ideas are worth nothing if you don't do anything with them. Um, and, and with that, um, uh, corporates also have realized that getting their machinery and play to build something it takes them a lot of time and most of the time what we see is that they're amazed and they cannot believe the speed at which today entrepreneurs can build things and for them it's inimaginable even for things that are relatively basic so um yeah the acquisition opportunity is always there and i think that if it's relevant enough it will be the case but what I always tell the, the corporates is what's the advantage you will have knowing that it's there for you to acquire. That's it. No other terms. It makes sense. It makes sense. And as you mentioned that, and I, I said that I've been, we've been in conversation with multiple different VCs in, in the region as well. There has been a huge shift in terms of the terms that are on the table. There has been clear advantage that, that, financiers have been taking from from the entrepreneurs and uh, we had a one podcast recording with manuel tanoira from uh, tca mm -hmm. uh, from buenos aires and he, he very clearly mentioned that you know he also started at the end of the 90s i think it was this around the same time 97 yep. he returned from california back to to argentina and he was talking about that goodness the the, the terms that they would they used to see were horrendous so at least there has been some progress in in in, in the past There's years been the incredible past years. progress um, and and I have to say I I've sat on the opposite side from him in negotiating terms more than once, and 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 he was the one that drafted the first term sheet that Wire had in Argentina. So let's not discuss too many details there. <laughs> oh, that that would be a juicy conversation. We need, we need to get Manuel and Gabby <laughs> on the on the same table and open up the the some of the the first contracts and <laughs> i i i would love to dive deeper into those and and see how they've changed and uh, but that is a very healthy sign but they, that they evolved means... the, they evolved a lot and he's contributed uh immensely to the ecosystem here and and it's part of the cycle right is 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 that the incentive has been very clear a little bit over a decade ago when when there has been no alternatives for for startups you know you take what you get and now there's at least when you go to pre-seed seed stage you have a little bit more a little bit more liquidity in the market that that 
the word would spread very quickly if a CVC or a VC would be seen as as a complete, you know, tyrant trying to exploit the startups. The founders talk, they talk a lot, and then, then they would never get any deal flow. So the times have changed into good. Yeah. Also, like corporates, they if they want to be on the deal, like if the CVC want to invest and be part of that cap table, they might be fast. And it might be like they could have that that capability to negotiate a very like open term shit with the with the company because most of them like the good ones they're getting oversubscribed so like if they really are willing to invest there and add value and 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 bring that promise that they that they're like selling the companies or or to the ecosystem they might be fast so i think like those barriers about like very strong term conditions uh, are 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 getting down right so yeah absolutely you mentioned absolutely. a great example uh when it's on on the on the competitive term sheets we're starting to see cases where the entrepreneurs sort of hold a place for us and it, because we take longer to evaluate than a uh, 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 financial vc does normally and and they hold a place for us because they understand that we bring value they want to um uh, they want to get so uh, that's a, a very important thing you're starting to see that and that i think is a symptom of uh the the, the value added is there absolutely and you mentioned there that you take a little bit longer what how how what is the normal let's say process that you you go through and why is it taking a little bit longer than a traditional vc well, what takes longer generally is is we do the same process that VC does plus establishing the strategic fit and what we can do with that corporation in order to push that startup forward. So the, that portion is the one that normally takes longer because we need to have a few backs and forth with the corporates and see how we're going to help them because we want to, you know, uh, be true to our word and 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 then execute on that. So we want those buy-ins before uh, we get into a deal, um, and 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 what kind of thing we'll be able to do, and and that normally takes you know a couple more iterations. What will probably be in in a competitive sort of uh, um, uh, round? I mean, any round people used to think, no, we can elaborate the term sheet in two weeks or. Uh, the reality is most most deals tend you know tend at least to take up about a quarter uh so three months and sometimes we we might take um you know one or a month longer or something like that. It all depends we have fast track things and we have that ability um but um you know it 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 is about that um Sometimes we even develop proofs of concept, which adds value to the entrepreneur before investing and before having any commitment. Um, and when they see that and that there's ability to develop value, then they they want you to be part of their cap table. So, uh, absolutely. And, and and from there is like um, you, you mentioned that it takes a little bit longer because you're gonna evaluate the mutual fit the strategic fit with the corporate and you're bouncing around ideas and 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 the plan with the corporates who are typically the the counterparts from the corporate side what type of people personnel um roles are involved in these discussions uh well generally um different set of business unit heads or specialists uh for example if it's a food tech company we would engage people from uh, our core on the, um, uh, development side on, uh, engineers, uh, and, 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 and people that, that have quite an expertise in developing products and, uh, and so on. Or we, uh, you know, we we'll look to the distributors or people that are on trade marketing. But if we want to say we want to apply something into the value chain, um, uh, it, it varies. It, it it normally tends to be um, management decision makers on, uh, uh, but also uh, quite a few specialists on on the different areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, then I would say that this is like one of the last last themes and questions over here is that um, 
let's say, Vanessa, you mentioned before we even start recording is that now when you're starting to expand more of your investments into LATAM, you're typically not necessarily leading, right? The, 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 the rounds. And Gabby, for you, are you leading or are you just following currently others? Uh, we've done both. Sometimes we lead, sometimes we follow. We don't have a set of, uh, set. Uh, rule for that. Uh, it depends. We, if it's interesting enough, we can lead and structure the round. Um, one thing I would say is we try to lead for other corporates, uh, because we want to make sure the terms are fair. Um, yeah. it's, it's more demanding in terms of, of work and back and forth to have to follow. And if we don't agree with the terms of, uh, of the other, it, it's more complicated. If it's sort of standard VC terms, or we're doing a safe or something like that, we don't mind. Yeah. And 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 then just here for both of you, um, in a, in a way that now when evaluating the landscape of of venture funding in in Latin America, when you look at the realities, is that let's say compared to Europe or the US, there are crazy amount of participants in very little rounds. And I, I think that's, that has been extremely fascinating to learn is that people are just following the herd like crazy. And, and my question to you is that why is this happening? Are you doing the same that you're just okay, taking the sexiest and the coolest ones that everybody thinks that they know what they're doing and then you're going to just follow suit? Um, and then what comes to also a second part of, of this question to you is that the, 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 the capability to conduct due diligence is extremely poor i i I would say based on our experience compared to europe or or the us what are you experiencing are you so uh uh, repeating myself is that are you felt like um are you following the crowd do you have the capability to execute independently let's say the unsexier routes and uh why do you think that people are not doing a proper duty uh dd Okay, um, so two parts to that question. One, uh, we are not necessarily following the herd at all. Uh, We do a lot of our own bets. Um, Sometimes they happen to be a sexy play and there's a competitive round, but sometimes no, and and we maybe in that uh, next round we, we... we build that sort of momentum for the company in the next round. Um, and in terms of that DD, I agree. Uh, the, there's very poor due diligence, particularly uh, on, 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 on sort of pure financial uh, deals. If they're not, they, they tend to run sort of the deeper due diligence is on, on the series A. Um, and, we tend to do more due diligence. Also, that's one of the reasons that our deals take longer. Uh, we do a technical due diligence. We do commercial. We do financial. We look at the people. We uh, look at impact. We look at uh, different things. Um, and because we have to complete that sometimes uh, between our term sheet and when we close, even when we are not leading, uh, we get some of the due diligence done by the lead, which we find to be sometimes lacking certain things. And and we we're having to complete the due diligence that wasn't done before. And I think it all comes down to cost in Latin America and the sizes of funds. Um, uh, I think it's primarily for that. It's not that they don't want to. Some people, when they're doing seed and uh, they do small checks, uh, they don't think the cost is, is, uh, you know, relevant enough. I believe that from, uh, a corporate perspective, um, the sort of reputational risk plays a big role. So even if we do a small check, we'll do a better due diligence. Yeah. I can contrast my, my opinion because on one side, like investing in the U S I mean, we make due diligence, we go into commercial, we go into like legal and, 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 and accountability details. But there's so much liquidity that, yeah, I mean, all the funds that are entering the round are willing to keep 
investing one and over and over and over again into the company. I mean, when it when it has a good product, right? And in Latin America, like, and this is how I can contrast my opinion. And it's because I, at what I used to be like a follower investor. So I used to take like all the terms and all the conditions and all the information that the founder already gave to the, to the lead investor. So we were pretty confident about it also because we, we weren't taking too much uh, equity from the companies, right? There, there were very small tickets, like from 150 and 300. So yeah, I think that's like a very difficult or, or that's, that's different from one side to, to the other. And it's the way here in Latin America, we're not maybe researching enough. Uh, there are very few funds, maybe as just Gavi said, that they're taking their time. But because also these companies are just like over subscribing. I mean, at this moment, it's not like that, but it used to be like one year ago or two years ago. Uh, and right now, I mean, maybe the speed as uh, how venture capital firms have been doing the deals have slowed down. So this is giving us more time to, to really understand the, the product, the technology behind what they're developing and, and many other pain points that maybe in the past we didn't. So yeah, I think that, that, that's something that, that it's helping us in, like today so that we can take a little bit longer and how, and how to make all our, our allocations. Yeah, absolutely. And Trista, is is it um, because let's say Gabby for you uh, um, from from the corporate side and 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 and, and CV side, uh, CVC side, is it because of the nature how you have structured your relationship with your LPs? Is that you have more let's say confidence and calmness to take the more contrarian route? And not necessarily follow the herd because let's say if we look at the reality is now a lot of more a lot of more funds were were created in in this last boom cycle at the very top of the of, of the cycle, a lot of first time fund managers, everybody hyping out, more entrepreneurs popping up every from every corner of, of Latin America. Then it became also sexy to become a, a VC at the same time. You may 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 hit a little little jackpot and you got a couple million exit as an entrepreneur, a young and thirty five year old guy or, or girl, and then you come in and you're going to go and you're going to think that I'm going to make all the companies that invest, you know, pure cold. And, and, but then they come into realization that they're going to start having really, really big pressure from their LPs because if they don't return the funds, uh, with a good margin, they're not going to raise the second fund and then the, the fund is over. So then I, I've seen this, this trend is that people, first time fund managers, especially are following the herd because they need to look sexy to their LPs so they can, you know, look good for the next fund. It's just the incentives are there. It's pretty clear. So do, do you have this, let's say, more calm, let's say, scenario that you don't need to to uh, every day look too good um, from the IRR perspective to to your LPs? Yes, I would say I would say we do have that sort of calmness because uh, a we look for um, that strategic fit and b. Um, uh, both my partner and I believe on, 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 on good, sustainable companies. Um, we are not chasing necessarily the next unicorn. Um, uh, if we, if we get one, we're extremely happy, of course, but if we don't, uh, I would rather have, you know, a good, solid, portfolio of companies with a good sort of medium return and have a stable return than rather have, you know, uh, I don't know, 80% of losers and 20% of, of hits or uh, I, I don't think, although we all know that one third of your portfolio is going to be what sort of repays most of the fund and, 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 and gives you the result. But we believe that um, in the way we strategize our portfolio management, uh, we would rather have less, um, um, you know, write-offs and and have sort of the the mid, sort of the middle section of our 
of our portfolio be a solid one and one that we might have to look at uh, ex, you know, uh, uh, exiting by, uh, you know, a different kind of M&A activity as we approach the, the time to do so. Um, but we're delivering uh, that strategic value to our LPs. Um, so we so we don't promise absurd returns. Our fund promises, you know, we're, we're in the 2.5 to 5x that we can, you know, we're not promising uh, absurd things and we have better upside all the great and then we and and we provide that strategic value and and we try to measure those KPIs for the corporates then the value of what we're doing is there um and also an, another thing is um I'm old enough I've been through sort of the motions and the and and some of the seasons on this uh I I I was in the 2000s and in the crisis and the dot com crisis as an entrepreneur. And I'm so we've been around the block a bit in terms of that to not get too excited on in 2021 and, and not to get too depressed uh, last year. So yeah. um, that's where yeah. we are. Great stuff. Hey, thanks <laughs> so much, Vanessa and Gabby, uh, to be here today and be part of the show and share your thoughts. I, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think you both do as well. And uh, I did, yeah. looking forward to meet you in person someday soon. <laughs>